<laughs> so um, good afternoon. Um, my name is LaVon Bell, and I would like to first say thank you to um, the friends of the National Park Service, the employees, the staff, all the other people that helped to make this exhibit. Of course, my collaborator, uh, Gita Westergaard, who's not here. She's currently in Denmark. Um, Brian and Nathan Bishop of Cruz and Gold, who lent us a lot of um, their collection, both of Cheney and their jewelry. Um, DPNR, the Virgin Islands State Historic Preservation Office, David Brewer, and the St. George Botanical Society, David Hayes, the archaeologist, and for all those who um, also contributed. Um, I just wanted to maybe first say how this exhibit came about. Um, technically, I met uh, Gita about a year ago when she was staying in one of my apartments. And uh, so I was her landlady. <laughs> and um, about six months into her trip, which was almost towards the end, I kind of looked at her and said, so what are you doing here again? And that is when we discovered we had this shared interest in this pottery. And very quickly, in the last month she was here, uh, came up with this idea for this exhibit, which I had actually pitched to the National Park Service a few years before. But I had really needed that other component to put it together. So um, in terms of Cheney, as Julie said, um, you know, a lot of you may already be familiar with what Cheney is. Cheney is actually an, a hybrid word. Um, you'll find from the colonial uh, time there was pottery that people used in their homes. Um, and when it got broken, you would find that people would either you know, discard it or they would pass it down to other people, whether it be their servants or enslaved people that worked for them. And these things eventually ended up in the ground. Um, and so we find them actually all throughout the Caribbean, but what is very unique about the Virgin Islands is we've created a terminology for them. Cheney is actually a hybrid word that is between China, um, kind of referencing the historical China that came from China, and money. And as we know, money is a type of currency. It's a platform in that way. If we think about currency not only as a, you know, kind of as a, a symbolic vehicle, um, a symbolic way of expressing things. And as an artist, that's how I came to Cheney. So I wanted to first tell you guys a little bit of a, a story. So in 2008, um, I went to Denmark for the first time. Um, I was invited there to do a project to investigate the colonial history between the Virgin Islands and um, Denmark. And I spent two months there. And a lot of the time that I spent there, I was looking. Because of course, if you're here in the Virgin Islands, we have so many visual markers and reminders of this time. And I thought that Denmark had something similar. I was very surprised it did not. But one day when I was walking down this particular street, um, I came across this store um, called the Royal Copenhagen. And I wasn't exactly sure why I was so drawn to this store at this point. But on the third floor, they had a museum space where they had all of these um, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm sorry, I'm assuming some of you guys know what the world comes So it's a, it's a very famous Danish brand, a luxury brand of China. Um, and so on the first two floors, you know, they had all of their beautiful displays. Um, Danes are very well known for their design. It was a very beautiful store. But on the very top, they had a museum space um, where they kind of told the history and had different plates. Now, what was interesting for me is at that moment, um, I was on the top floor and I seen kind of what I've shown you here, uh, but much more massive, where there was walls and walls of historical plates that were done chronologically. And as I start to look back at that moment, I realized that that was this, that these plates were the, int the whole parts of the Cheney that I had never seen before. And it was an epiphany for me. It was very overwhelming because, you know, when you grow up, always seeing fragments of things, you don't, you just kind of take it for granted. And to be able to see the entire plate and kind of really connect it to this larger history um, really kind of changed the course of my work in some ways. And one of the things that I learned, um, and I'll tell you what happened in this interaction. So I go to the curator of the museum and I tell them, I'm from the Virgin Islands. Um, I got kind of a strange reaction, like where? <laughs> I usually have to say, and I have to say it in Danish for them to kind of have a recognition. But 
Um, I asked the curator, do you have any plates that deal with the Virgin Islands? Um, the person at the museum didn't know, but they sent me, uh, gave me an email address to find out from the head curator. During that time, I had done research on my own. Um, and I started finding on eBay these collectible plates that were very specific to the Virgin Islands. They were created in the early 1900s. Um, um, and, and again, they were part of the Royal Copenhagen Collection. Um, in between me finding the plates and writing this email, um, you know, I was able to find probably about nine. And I had asked the head curator first. I'm looking at these really tiny images on the internet, blurry. You know, um, is there any way I could see the actual plates? I explained who I was, what I was there doing, and I was denied access, which was kind of interesting for me. Of course, it's a corporate, it's not a public archive, but it also highlighted for us, for Virgin Islanders, how we often do not have access to our records, both documents and objects. The second part is um, he had gone through, um, I had found other plates. I'll actually show you some of those. Um, I found some other plates, um, and there was one in particular, uh, this one, of the Jutland. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, actually. But um, this is of a famous ship in Denmark. And the last time it sailed was right out here, in the Christiansted Harbor, when the king um, was making his decision on whether or not to sell the colonies. And we all know what that decision was. So for me, I had included it in these archives. And there was a, in this email exchange, there was this debate that the head curator had denied that inclusion. And one of the things that I had learned from that experience was it really matters who sees these objects because we will have different narratives to tell. I thought it was perfectly valid that I had decided to use this and create my own archive and my own way of shaping these objects. Um, but it was interesting that that was pushed back because he felt that he had the authoritative stance that no, this is, these are the actual plates. And I had known what he meant because, for example, some of these plates were commissioned to, for example, create the hospital or the orphanage. And um, some of the ones that I had shown you earlier, like these, um, you know, of course, depicted very specific plates from the Virgin Islands. One of the things that I really learned from that experience that changed the trajectory of my work, as I said, was in terms of who can tell the narrative. Um, and that narrative was very central to these objects. Um, so I'm kind of, I know I'm like bouncing back and forth here, so just excuse me. Um, so when Gita and I met, um, oh actually, let me, let me explain to you the, the piece that I created based on these. So you might have noticed that there's a difference between the one on the left and the right. I don't know if you guys can pick it up. Can you? They're of the same image, Stars. but one is done on a different material. So the one on the right is done on paper plates. Maybe you can see it now. Um, so when I was there, one of the things that I had done was um, in researching this collection, which this piece um, as an artist is called Collectible, it was thinking about the colonial trade and the relationship, and I had done a reproduction of all the plates that I had found that specifically referenced the Virgin Islands, but reproduced them on paper plates. So that's the image that um, you're seeing here. And of course, we know what we do with paper plates. We dispose of them. We throw them away when we finish. It's, very, it's a very utilitarian object. And so, you know, again, this is kind of the way that I, as an artist, have operated in this kind of very symbolic uh, field with objects. Um, now, when we came to the exhibit, uh, it was interesting working with Gita because, of course, I'm an artist and I had a very specific way that I had been dealing with these plates. And what she was able to bring, she was studying um, heritage, sustainable heritage ma management in Denmark and had been doing work here, working with um, both the archaeologists and the interpreters at uh, the National Park Service with their own archives. And one of the things that we were able to kind of come up with is that we wanted to look at the multiple ways that Cheney um, is used in our society today um, and how we can kind of interpret that. So um, I had already started creating a, a series of paintings that I had subtitled Cheney, We Live in the Fragments, and I'll talk more about that. But we kind of start to use that as a way to think about the themes of the exhibit. 
So um, one of them, of course, is we find the fragments, right? Um, and this is because I think for many of us, uh, we encounter uh, Cheney either in our properties or in other people's properties at the beach. Um, and so that's kind of the first step, that, that they're, they're these objects that we, that we keep encountering, that they're not lost, that we often find them after a hard rainfall like today. You can go into the gutters, you can go into, you know, and you'll find them. It's, it's pretty common. So this is a house that I bought in 2011 um, in Free Gut that's led me on a whole other trajectory and a project. But I, I would find Cheney there, and that was my first real experiencing experience finding uh, Cheney. Um, and as I did that, I, you know, it gave me... Uh, I, I would just, you know, almost like there were these mini paintings and this treasure that I would kind of keep encountering. It's almost like this history that did not want to be forgotten. Another um, thing, of course, is that we also wear these. We have a jewelry tradition, which is what uh, uh, Julie referenced. Um, I don't know if I can actually pinpoint a date, but I know that, for example, we collaborated a lot with Cruz and Gold, um, who were one of the first to kind of start taking the Cheney and setting them into jewelry. And I think um, this is some examples of some of the work that's in the exhibit. And this is some examples of something I have on right now. Um, and I know, I think it's by wearing it, it's almost a form of claiming it. It's almost a way of taking ownership, not just of the object, but also of the stories. I know that some people have, uh, it's somewhat actually controversial. Um, because if you think about um, this colonial uh, dinnerware, for some people they think that it's actually, you know, kind of this, a symbol of the colonial powers. And so for African descended people, it's it can be kind of seen as controversial that why would you wear kind of, I had a friend that said it on Facebook, she said, it's the masses baubles, you know, these, and I thought, um, I, you know, I think that that is another narrative and another interpretation of it that is valid. But for myself, I really thought about them as um, that you can inscribe other narratives in these objects. And they're also this, this way that these, almost like a resistance story that will not be forgotten. Um, and so as I've been doing my work, I would often... Um, go into people's collections and do this. I would kind of, you know, lay them out into a, a grid so they would all be separated and I'd start taking pictures of them. And the series of work that was developed um, was a series of paintings that I started in 2015. Um, actually, I'm going to skip through this really quick because I want to talk about the paintings. And what I would do is I would... Um, I would look at these fragments as almost as if they were mini paintings, but one of the things that I found really interesting um, that connected back to that experience that I had in Denmark in 2008 is this feeling of seeing a whole but only having a piece. Um, and so I thought, you know, we usually see these, you know, Cheney, you might find them about this big. It's very rare to find big pieces, actually. Um, and I thought about for me, I, my, I try to approach them as a way of reconnecting. And I, I often call these paintings process paintings. As you can see, this is kind of a in process. And what I would do is I would take some of the pieces and then I would try to figure out how they could merge together. But what would often happen is if I would look at a piece and I didn't know, for example, where the rest of that flower petal was, or I didn't understand the full pattern because I only had two repetitions and maybe it repeated, repeated five or six times. Um, what I'd have to use is my imagination, which is an extremely powerful tool. And it's kind of what has helped us as African descended people to survive um, the colonial oppression and the colonial system was our imagination, was our ability to fill in the blanks for things that were displaced, lost or broken. And I thought that that was a really beautiful metaphor for Caribbean society as a whole, because of course we do not have our entire African identities, nor our entire European identities, nor our entire U indigenous identities, but we're able to piece it together into these new, a new society, a new, a new place. 
So in some ways, that's what these paintings were for me. They were trying to create a new space. I almost sometimes also call them my um, restorative maps, um, a way of kind of piecing together and charting a, a, a history. Um, these are some of the, the other ones. Um, not all of them are in the exhibit. Uh, I believe this one is, as well as this one. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this one, because as I kind of skip through some of the groupings, um, typically when I would approach the paintings, I would take, um, I would really make it very pattern-based, and I was looking for patterns that made sense. Um, I thought one of the things that I found was really interesting is that as I would be looking at the patterns, sometimes patterns were difficult to do, um, especially some of the transfer work that, um, I, and I would just kind of ignore them. And so the, I thought that was interesting because when we think symbolically as well, there are many narratives to our history that we also like to ignore or forget. Um, and I felt that the paintings in doing them really recreated that process in the same way that there's certain patterns that I liked a lot and I would repeat them over and over and over again and I'd put them all over the painting. Um, and we, of course, we know that there's certain narratives and stories about our history and ourselves that we also like to repeat. Um, and some examples of that could be we love to talk about Queen Mary and we love to talk about our resistance. Um, in the Danish context, it might have been we love to say that, or they love to say that they're the first to abolish the slave trade, even though that's not quite true. But those are the parts of their history and their narrative that they want to repeat. And there are many parts also on both sides that we tend to not want to deal with. They're too hard. Um, and so I felt that the paintings also represented that. But this one was the first one where I really tried to think about groupings. Um, these are all... As you can, s I mean, I, don't, I think it's obvious, but they're tops of buildings. Um, and so this would come out of uh, the, the tradition of Cheney where, I mean, of course, mo a lot of them are imitations of uh, Chinese um, landscapes and themes. It was, it's actually really interesting because, you know, the Europeans were imitating the Chinese, and then at one point the Chinese started imitating the European imitation of themselves, and it, um, so I really thought that, you know, embedded inside of these plates and these fragments that we receive of them is this whole history of how different um, cultures interpret one another. But with this painting, I, I found it was my first attempt at thinking about just finding patterns that were very similar and trying to recreate almost um, this infinite landscape, seascape, uh, all at the same time. Um, this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a project proposal. You know, I actually come full circle right now. So as I mentioned to you, I started thinking about this work in 2008 when I first went to Denmark and walked into the Royal Copenhagen. Um, last summer, uh, as the centennial started to come closer, you know, as I said, that experience changed the direction of my work. It's, I pretty much have dealt with the coloniality of the Virgin Islands, both its past and present, for the past eight to nine years. That's most of what my work deals with. And so as the centennial started approaching, I started getting a lot of interest from various institutions about my work. Um, so I spent last summer in Denmark for about three weeks doing um, some prepara preparatory research for an exhibit that just opened in March, and it's going on until June in Copenhagen. And when I was there, um, about a year ago, I had had this idea of, you know, I'm taking fragments and I'm making them whole, so pieces of plates, and I'm making them paintings. Wouldn't it be interesting to then go back to try to create fragments of my paintings and turn them into plates? And one day it just kind of crazily entered my head, wow, I should maybe approach the Royal Copenhagen, um, which uh, was nerve-wracking for me. You know, it's one of those things that you just think, ah, maybe, and then you go, ah, no, never. Never, why would they, you know, why would they do that? Um, 
But as the centennial approached, and I, I decided to formalize my proposal, and then I started telling people about my proposal. And when I was there, I actually had a, an artist, you know, one of these late nights in an artist studio where she said to me, how could you not submit it? Like, it's a great proposal. So I did, and I got a call back in 24 hours um, from the head of the uh, creative department, which was, I didn't realize how much of a surprise and what a big deal that was until I started telling people that I have a meeting with the Royal Copenhagen to do a project. And people looked at me like, what? And um, so here I am, um, you know, nine years later from walking into the Royal Copenhagen, um, wandering in uh, to being the first Virgin Islander to be commissioned to do a project and the first black artist also that they've ever worked with. Um, and so these series of plates are gonna be produced later on this year in addition to uh, the Herald, which is um, <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thing. So you know how in the United States you have Oscars and you know they give them prize. There's actual physical thing for a prize. So the Royal Copenhagen in Denmark often get creates the prize for the Film Institute or you know various organizations. And the one that I've been invited to create the the uh, object for is for the University of Copenhagen and um, it's called the Harold. It's pretty much an owl that they commission an artist to do once a year to decorate it however you want and um, I think it's pretty much easy to figure out what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> um, but this is an example of the you know what was sent to me in the mail about a month ago. Um, and so that project has started and um, you know when I think about this exhibit um, you know it's unfortunate that Gita is not able to be here because she of course is really more of the expert in terms of some of the actual artifacts and the objects and the history behind them but I encourage you guys to of course see the exhibit because it's all documented in there but I'll do my best to answer any questions that you guys have on on any of the sides of what we've been talking about uh, where I've been talking about and, and we and, and because it is really a community conversation um, you know one of the things that we were hoping to raise of course is this more awareness of what Cheney is but also you know in terms of the phenomenon that's starting to happen now is that a lot of people are you know they hunt Cheney down they they're using it almost it's encouraged for tourists to pick them up um, and there are questions, legal and historical and patrimonial questions about what happens when we've taken all these objects and we kind of just sell them off and tourists take them. Um, and that was also one of the things that we wanted to raise in the exhibit, not necessarily to answer that question ourselves, but to get people to think about what that means. Um, so yeah, I will open up for questions. Well, hon, thank you. And I want to commend you on your connection with World Cup. Um, we don't actually, I really it, It's outstanding because we actually, Gita, myself, and a Danish West Indian uh, son, Roland Anderson, whose father was um, Fulmer Anderson, uh, which we, the Park Service, uh, has their his collection of archaeology, very outstanding pre pre Amerindian archaeology materials in the in the uh, collections in the fort, and so Roland is about 98 years old. He lives in California. He is the son of this former Danish plantation manager on Saint Croix. He's still quite alive and quite spirited, and so the centennial is coming up. And get a phone call. I get phone calls from Roland about every quarter. And I pick up the phone. Sandy, it's Roland Anderson. Good afternoon, Roland. How is it in California? But it's fabulous to be connected to this family that has such a her her heritage and history with St. Croix. And so this phone call was Sandy. The centennial is coming. We have to get a commemorative plate. You have to get in touch with Royal Copenhagen and get a commemorative plate. I have mine. I'm sending it to you. I have mine from the, fit night, the 50th anniversary. We need, oh, oh whoa. <laughs> and he was reaching through the phone from California. 
So Gita was in Denmark. And I said, Gita, can you contact Royal Copenhagen? You speak Danish. <laughs> Would be ridiculous for me to try to call them. I thought about calling Nina. I said, Nina, help. But Gita was there. Push back. And she was a Dane. It's very difficult. Blonde and blue eyed. <laughs> Spoke the language. They thought we were nuts. <coughs> they said, no money. There's no money in making a commemorative plate. When I was a kid down here, every Christmas. Yes. How many of us uh, had those Christmas plates? Okay. Every Christmas, Royal Copenhagen had a new Christmas plate, and you went and you went with mom, and you you know, little kid, and dressed up, and you go to the Royal Copenhagen, and you get your plate. And Roland was right. We should have a commemorative plate. So, kudos to you. <laughs> Because um, it was a, a non-starter. I mean, we even talked to the friends group about it. I said, Roland, I said, let's reach out to the friends group. Maybe we can come up and we talk to a bunch of people about it. Anyway, well, maybe we'll get that commemorative plate. I mean, I think what was, because that, of course, the, the proposal that I pitched to them was to turn my plates into an official commemorative plate. Um, I actually, I wish I had put an image up of the one that they did for the 50th anniversary, but it was super, it was, you know, a palm tree and a sugar mill, and it was, it was quite of a colonial iconography, and I thought, we can do better than that, surely, for the 100th. But when I met with the creative director, he said to me, you know, you know I, I really, I, I pushed really hard for this plate, because that's what I was there for. And um, he basically said that they'd stopped making those kinds of plates almost 10 years ago, that they do not make money, they were not, it's old fashioned, that's not, it was, it was like a, a backward direction. And I said, I pushed and put, but 100 years only comes around, but 100 years, I mean, this is, wouldn't you consider? And he said, no, and this is how some of the other projects came about. Um, but yes, I mean, I'll be honest, in the meeting that I had with him, he spent the first 15 minutes telling me how unusual it was. He said, this does not happen. I get probably six proposals a week from people who make cars to shoes to anything that want to work with us in our designs. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't only the designs that I submitted him that he found was fascinating. He said it was a story. It was a story behind Cheney. And, and, this, and that's, what, that's what he wanted to know more about. Um, and that's what um, he found was really, really interesting, this kind of resurfacing of these fragments and this way of re-piecing them together. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited, and it is uh, an honor for sure. <laughs>